Hi guys, welcome to another HSC chemistry video in the production of materials series. We are looking at um, radioactivity and this time we're going to look at some of the transuranic elements. So synthesizing elements beyond uranium in a periodic table. Uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element. Um, being so large, it is radioactive and so all of the isotopes of uranium are radioisotopes and that's because of their large size. Anything beyond uranium in the periodic table um, is called a transuranic element and all of these have been synthesized in a laboratory. The first transuranic elements uh, were produced in nuclear reactors. Simple reactions, well not simple, but um, basically the addition of a neutron to a um, uranium atom, so in this case uranium-238, with the addition of a neutron produced an unstable form of uranium, uranium-239, and this underwent beta decay, this is the beta particle, uh, in order to form Neptunian. And Neptunian is number 93, it's the next one in the periodic table above, um, above uranium. Now, Neptunium also undergoes uh, beta decay, and when it undergoes uh, beta decay, it produces another beta particle, which is going to um, allow us to produce the next one, which is uh, Plutonium-239, the next um, element after Neptunium. So, uh, and the beta decay, of course, is a, a 0, 1, a 1, and this is the way that the first couple of transuranic elements were produced. These are neutron rich radioisotopes and this was fine for the first couple but once we started to try and form elements beyond plutonium then we started to run into some problems with neutrons so we needed to look for something different. So nuclear reactors is the first way that we can produce transuranic elements and those primarily are neptunium and plutonium. In order to produce some of the larger uh, transuranic elements, we need a particle accelerator. And that meant that we were starting to look at firing larger particles into our target atoms. So this might include things like the helium nucleus, the alpha particle, in order to try and maximize the amount of um, mass that we were actually able to combine into the nucleus. The first ones that were produced were uh, actually as far back as 1919 when Ernest Rutherford was doing his experiments. Um, he, he was the first one to do this sort of thing and um, you can see one example of a commercial radioisotope being produced in the particle accelerator through the addition of a um, alpha particle to nitrogen and that uh, would then produce uh, a fluorine nucleus. When Rutherford did the experiment first of all, his experiment involved the bombardment of nitrogen with a uh, helium nucleus, uh, an alpha particle, and he did a lot of his experiments with uh, alpha particles. Um, but his, um, his creation, if you like, was uh, the oxygen, the unstable, one of the unstable isotopes of oxygen, um, and also he produced a proton as well. Uh, so this was one of the things that um, uh, Rutherford did in his experiment and we have kind of been able to duplicate in a slightly different way to produce um, the fluorine atom or the fluorine nucleus in this case. Um, transuranic elements are also things that can be produced in particle accelerators. So um, one of the transuranic elements is californium and it is produced through the bombardment of a uh, uranium-238 uh, isotope with a carbon nucleus. So 6 and 12 for carbon. What we produce is an atom or a nucleus of californium-98 and we also produce four um, neutrons as a byproduct. One of the things that you find is that these um, escaping neutrons can also start uh, to be involved in kind of chain reaction uh, processes, 
that sometimes happens, but not always. And of course, if it does happen, we want to control those processes. And, and there's a lot of uh, coolants and controlling rods that are a part of uh, most of the experiments that occur um, around nuclear chemistry. So the important thing is we want to fire a charged particle like uh, the nucleus of a helium atom or a carbon atom, as you saw in the last slide, at the nucleus of a target atom. The problem is that each of the um, little particles that we're firing, because they're a nucleus, have a positive charge and also a reasonable mass. So does the target nucleus. In fact, it not only has a positive charge, but it is very, very massive in terms of the comparison between something like a helium nucleus or a carbon nucleus. And so the natural tendency is for the nucleus to repel the particle. In order to overcome this natural um, repulsion between two positive charges, which naturally want to move apart from one another, we need an, a very large amount of energy to really try and push them together. And this is the purpose of the particle accelerators. Um, there are a couple of different types of accelerators. The two main types that we, we will sort of briefly touch on are linear and circular accelerators. Um, specifically, we'll have a look at cyclotrons as an example of a circular accelerator, but um, we could also look at synchrotrons. And I think there's a point where um, you probably need to have some familiarity with these without learning a lot in a lot of detail. So if you um, confine yourselves to looking at linear particle accelerators and a cyclotron as a circle, circular um, particle accelerator, um, that's sufficient. And the main takeaway point is they make charged particles move very, very quickly. And that high speed increases their kinetic energy. We know kinetic energy is a half mv squared. So mass is one thing, but if we can increase the speed of the particle, then we can increase its kinetic energy and, and hopefully it will have sufficient kinetic energy to overcome that repulsive force. Linear accelerators are basically a combinations of positive and negatively charged tubes that progressively switch on and off in order to um, attract and push charges along the track. Now these types of linear accelerators can be extraordinarily long um, and, and as a consequence there can be a very um, large acceleration given to the particles as they pass through the linear accelerator. Uh, one of the uses of linear accelerator is to um, turn or at least fire um, some nickel, so turn bismuth into rengenium. Um, so here's an example where the um, nickel 64, so this is the nickel 64 isotope, is being fired at bismuth 209. So you can see some tubes here where we've got electric fields being set up, which we're going to try and push them through. We've got drift tubes where the particles will just move and, um, and then some push-pull um, uh, systems as well to try and pull the particle along and then continue to push it on its way. The ions accelerate between the tubes and once they're inside the tubes then they move at a constant speed so we want to sort of move them, speed them up, move them again, speed them up and so on. As a consequence of this the nickel particles bump into the bismuth and if they have sufficient energy then they may actually bind together and form this very large transuranic element of rengenium, number 111. Associated with that will be the loss of a single neutron. Circular accelerators, obviously a lot smaller than um, the kilometer long linear accelerators. Um, and these work by um, a centripetal force, it's centripetal acceleration as the particles are moving around in a circle. Um, the two circular ones, the cyclotrons and the synchrotrons, work in slightly different ways and they uh, make use of magnetic fields. You may or may not be aware of the fact that a moving charge um, creates or induces a magnetic field and this can be um, then 
uh, impacted upon or we can apply forces by applying magnetic fields to these charges in order to continue to accelerate them. Again, the main takeaway message is that these um, circular particle accelerators are all about trying to accelerate charged particles and give them a huge speed as they're moving around. So here's another one, um, not quite as long as the last one, but certainly in terms of its uh, circumference, a fairly large um, uh, circular accelerator. So what sort of questions are we likely to get for this topic? Well, here's one from 2006 worth three marks. We need to describe how technology has enabled the transuranic elements to be produced. So this is a description. How is this happening? What sort of technology? And we want transuranic elements. So we want to make sure that we're talking about more than one. So when we do this, it's probably easiest to think about the fact that the first transuranic elements were produced in nuclear reactors and an equation which um, identifies the formation of neptunium or plutonium would be good. But also the use of particle accelerators is important. And accelerators. And if you are um, in your discussion um, identifying any of those uh, elements that are pretty much beyond plutonium, um, so any of the ones that we've looked at in this video would be useful for you. Um, gives you a bit of an idea about how to structure this in, how to structure this answer to make sure you get full value for the question. When we look at the reports, and it's useful sometimes to have a look at the reports from the previous HSC papers, you can see sometimes questions are not well answered by a large number of candidates. This means that if you are able to put together a good response for these sorts of questions, you can often put yourself in front of a large number of students who either talk about some things in general terms or slightly um, have slight misconceptions. Most important is to identify the difference between transuranic and radioactive. The two terms are not interchangeable. Transuranic are radioactive just because of their size, but not all radioactive are transuranic. So for example, we know that carbon-14 is a radioisotope and it will break down through beta decay but carbon-14 is not a transuranic element. They must be uh, above uh, uranium in the periodic table. Therefore, their atomic number must be greater than 92. And carbon is 6. So obviously, carbon-14 is not a transuranic element. So be aware of these sorts of misconceptions and make sure you're dealing specifically uh, on there. The better responses identified from this year defined transuranic elements as those beyond 92 in the table and the main features of the two types of technology and examples. So you should always try to include equations or at least uh, nuclear equations in this case um, to help explain things and make sure that you include both the nuclear reactors and the particle accelerators in your response. So. Um, when we're looking at this sort of a question, make sure that you have discussed um, something that can be produced, um, such as Neptunium from a particle accelerator, along with the associated um, equation, and also something like Californium, which has been produced in a particle accelerator, both of which are examples of transuranic elements, and both of which can be produced in processes that are synthetic, as neither of these occurs naturally on Earth. Thanks for watching.